Hi, everyone. Welcome to our live lion drawing event. Um, we will be learning how to sketch and draw lions uh, from Marianne Bartlett, the director of Art Safari. So just to get everybody um, acquainted with the 800 Lions campaign that has been running for the last few months, um, we're going to show you a little introductory video. Did you know that South Africa legally exports lion skeletons and body parts? We need you to be the voice for our lions. Express your voice for these lions through an art form of your choice. Your representation could be in the form of painting, drawing, coloring, photography, music, dance, poetry. Together, we can move South Africa's leaders to set a zero lion bone export quota. Welcome everybody to those of you who have joined us um, in the last few minutes. Welcome to this live sketching tutorial um, in, in support of the 800 Lions campaign. Um, first, I would like to thank you all for joining us. We are very excited about this and very much looking forward um, to seeing all of your sketches um, in our 800 Lions uh, submissions afterwards. I'm going to start off by introducing you to um, Marianne Bartlett, who will be um, teaching us this evening. Um, Marianne is the director of Art Safari. Hi, Marianne. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> we have my, my camera so you can actually see me here. No, that's fine. So there we are. Now we can see you. <laughs> um, so yes, Marianne is the is the director of Art Safari. Um, just so that everybody um, knows, as we're starting off, Marianne is going to do four um, sketching tutorials this evening. Am I right, um, Marianne? Um, with different drawing techniques, um, if I'm not mistaken. So we're all very much looking forward to to seeing. Um, how everything turns out. So without further ado, I'm going to, yes, hand over um, to you and you can um, get started on the first tutorial. Um, just, just very quickly for everybody watching, the tutorials are going to be um, kind of broken up and we're going to be speaking to a few experts in the field um, and some um, from Blood Lions and from World Animal Protection this evening. So, um, yes, enjoy everybody and over to you, Marianne. Okay. Well, thanks very much for drawing with me this evening. I, I'm hoping that many of you have got pencils and paper to hand, even if you've just got a, a borrow and a piece of A4 paper. That's great. It's all about learning the different techniques that we might use in the field to draw lions from life or to draw any animal from life really. So I'm going to take you through four different types of exercise. Um, the first one is actually one of my favorites. It's just to the way, a really good way of getting started. It's, it's a scribble technique and, and it's just finding a way around the animal, finding a way around the form. Um, then I'll take you into some shape exercises and then finally into uh, looking at uh, the backbone and hanging the animal on, on, on the backbone of the animal. So I'll take you to my drawing board now. So um, I will just switch over screens a moment and then I'm going to start scrib um, scribbling. I'll just show you just before I start, I'm going to be using a Caran d'Ache water soluble pencil. Um, I may well bring in some other types of, of materials as well. So I might bring in uh, a pen, I might bring in some watercolour um, just to give you a bit of form um, with the watercolour. But the water soluble is really good for working um, with uh, on, on any kind of wildlife um, because it's so movable and you can add water afterwards. So let me just switch cameras now. 
And hopefully you can see a big blank page. And I'm going to start just scribbling away and trying to find this uh, a lion who's sitting up here. He's a lion that I saw in um, Botswana. And I'm just scribbling now on the page. And can you? I'm hoping that you can see the lines properly, clearly enough. So I'm finding various shapes and just scribbling around them. And this scribble technique can give you a, 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 a tiny bit of a cartoon animal, but don't worry about it because as you draw, you carry, keep on putting more and more pressure onto the animal, um, onto the page here. And so you can just see more and more detail appearing. It's quite light at the moment. I may well want to locate where the eyes are. Just as I scribble away, it's quite light pressure, as I said. I'm also going to locate where the nose is and the angle of that nose down to the chin. And then because I'm working quite lightly, and do you see I'm, I'm holding the pencil quite far away from, from the tip, so I've got in a way less control than normal, but um, it allows me to work very freely and from my shoulder rather than from my hand, from my wrist or from my fingers. Normally when we're writing, we, we just work from our fingers we have that firm control. I might use a bit of control later when I come into the eyes here. But actually at the moment, I'm, I'm using the pencil much more as a tool rather than a, a, a writing implement. And we're so used to holding our, um, our pens and pencils as writing implements, just use it as a playful tool that you can just scribble along the page and find your animal. And Marianne, are you using a photo reference or are you doing this from memory? Because yeah. it's absolutely incredible to start with. <laughs> Here I have actually got a photograph. Um, I would often be working from a sketch, but I thought, well, this uh, let's, let's work from a photo this time. Um, it does make it, uh, um, it's a different challenge for me because I, I'm ha having been guiding um, and on safari for so many years, for the last uh, 20 years, it's very awkward for me to actually work from photographs. So this is actually almost a bit more of a, a challenge for me to, to make this lifelike really, to only work working when I'm working from, uh, from a photo. Um, so, so yes, I do have a photo and I'd encourage you to, to work from, from photographs, um, obviously, um, uh, I'm so lucky that I have been able to lead safaris and have been able to to work from life as well. And here I'm just continuing to scribble. And as I scribble, I'm going to add tone. I'm going to get darker. So I'm looking for those recesses. See here, we've got where the flank, where his whole body is coming down. It's all coming in this direction, isn't it? So there's a, I can even see in the photograph, I can see where that line meets there and I can follow the shadow around that front leg and it's still really a scribble. I always love the, the you can really enjoy some areas can't you because here we've got those the lovely furry bits between the paws aren't they satisfying to do. Yeah those paws are, are amazing I mean even when you see when you see a lion, especially in the wild, when they're walking on the road and you see those those massive paws just flopping, I think it's yeah. the best word to use. Yeah. They flop because they're so big and so furry, as you said. And then I can put down extra tone here where his belly, his belly is obviously coming around this area. And then the inner part of the leg is also very dark coming to the paw, the back, the back, the hind leg here and the back paw. 
and curving around. And I'm just allowing that pencil to curve around uh, the, the leg. And sometimes it's just nice to think, well, maybe my, my pencil is, is actually almost touching this animal. It's almost touching. But I can be very fluid here and I can also add in layers and layers of tone into the area I'm sure of roughly in the right place. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm hoping all the rest of this team are busy drawing at home as well. I got started, but I'll admit I got left behind, so I'm going to wait for the next tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> and I do have, I've got located the ear there, but he's just getting a bit, the ear is getting a little bit lost. And here I'm also just looking at the, he's he's just been in the, in the salon, hasn't he? He's got a fabulous, fabulous new hairdo. And I can bring and really enjoy the pencil mark around on the main. And I can then start to be a little bit more definite around some of these areas, around the mouth, around the nose. Do you see I've just changed my, my hand position on the pencil? And I'm going to work into where those eyes are. And also now I can, I have, um, a lovely strong sharp tip to the pencil and it's allowing me to go very very dark in that pencil mark and just slightly find where the eyes where those pupils are and I can still continue to scribble and find more form. So he's just appearing, he's just appearing. It's very hard to see in the photograph here because it's all in shadow. The shadow is creeping around his nose and all this part of the mane is also very dark. And you see when you're scribbling, it doesn't really matter if some of the lines don't quite meet. I can harden up some of them. I can add some grasses. Somehow the grasses always give such a good effect. It helps with the habitat. And if we wanted to, we can have some bushes in the, in the background. And it gives him a sense of place, doesn't it? As soon as you put something in the distance. See how mobile my pencil is? I'm moving over the whole page all the time. Now you must interrupt me if I need to move on, if you need to move on, because I could carry on scribbling for a long time. And I could carry on watching you. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely mesmerizing. It's gorgeous. Um, what I did want to ask you quickly, um, Marianne, is changing from kind of focusing on the line to focusing on the background and the and the grasses, is that, um, I don't want to say is it normal, but, you know, I'm quite a structured person, so I do the line and then the background, but is it quite good to chop and change? Um, no, I would... I would always keep mobile and and really um you want your eyes especially when you're out in the bush you might you might suddenly see that hey there's there's uh there are some some vultures sitting here mm -hmm. um, you That's might amazing. you might see a little bit more detail that you hadn't noticed before you might actually see that there's uh some some impala here 
and there might be something else happening in a landscape. So whatever happens when you're out in the bush, you want to keep mobile and keep your eyes looking in all sorts of different directions um, because you can get tra too transfixed. And if you were working simply on a portrait, well, we could go to a zoo. Yes. We could just uh, be working from um, an animal and to give uh, and a captive animal and to give an animal a sense of place is so important. Um, and being able to see that landscape is just incredible. So thank you, thank you very much, Marianne. Um, I'm going to to um, move on and bring bring through the topic of why we're here um, to remind everybody, just so you can have a bit of a break from your sketching, you can carry on. Um, please, you know, add a little bit to your sketch. Um, but I think it's important to remind ourselves um, what the 800 Lions campaign um, aims to do and why it was it was started. So I'm going to um, bring Louise uh, Louise Duval, who is our the Blood Lions campaign manager. Um, hi, Louise. You will need to unmute yourself. I am unmuted now. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. So, um, yes, uh, just for everybody who is watching, um, Louise is, is the Bloodlines campaign manager. And I think that the very first question that, that we need to ask is, um, can, can you explain a little bit about the, the 800 Lions campaign and why we're here tonight creating these amazing pieces of lion art? Sure. Yeah. Um, as you've probably noticed, uh, the 800 Lions campaign we launched at um, World Lion Day on the 10th of August this year, together with World Animal Protection. And um, it's really all focused around um, the, uh, the official, the legal lion bone export quota. So South Africa, as um, hopefully most people will know, but I'll, I'll just give a very quick overview. South Africa has a captive commercial breeding uh, industry of, of lions and, and many other big cats. And that industry uh, is, is, is a commercial, completely commercial um, uh, endeavor um, and lions are being uh, exploited and commodified all along their their life cycle so from the time that they're cubs they're being taken away from the mothers they're being petted they're being hand reared by volunteers they're being walked with um, they get too old too dangerous they go on uh, to the next stage they might be uh, become a, a breeding mom themselves or they are being held in a facility until they're old enough to enter the captive lion um, hunting industry. And many of the lions these days, we're actually breeding very specifically for their bones. And South Africa has been exporting lion skeletons since about 2006 when it started. And the reason why we're exporting them is that uh, tiger bones are traditionally used in traditional Chinese medicine um, and tigers are obviously extremely rare these days and so lion bones are, are supplementing that tiger bone trade. Um, and since 2008, between 2008 and 17, um, to give uh, everybody a little bit of an idea, South Africa has exported 6,634 skeletons. So we've basically slaughtered, because let's just use the right word here, we've killed that number, 6,634 lions for their bones um, and in exported that. Uh, that is in a 10-year in a period. That's so that's cool. more than 600, that's nearly 700 lions on average uh, per year. 
Um, and yes, I can see messages, people saying too shocking. It's, um, it is a shocking industry. Um, so as a result, in, in the last few years, South Africa has been allowed by CITES to set an official legal line bone export quota. Um, but in the last couple of years, they have not been able to set that because of a high court ruling. Um, and basically, um, because the, 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 the department has never um, taken welfare of the animals into consideration. Um, so the export quota has been zero for 2019 and this year 2020. And what we want in at Blood Lions and World Animal Protection and, and many people, we know many people in South Africa and worldwide, is for that quota to stay zero. So 800 voices for 800 lions is representing the last legal lion bone export quota that South Africa set, which was 800 lions for 2017 and 800 lions in 2018. So it's a representation um, to reflect the number of lions that we legally exported in the last few years. And why why art? Why did yeah. why did this this art campaign come around? It's it's not every day that you have have a campaign like this, and it's been incredibly. Um, uh, inspirational, I would say. Yes. Yeah, I think inspirational is the right word. Um, so yeah, we've we felt that um, you know art and, and and Marianne, we've we've just been happy mesmerized and watching Marianne and draw and it's it's a very powerful expression of people's beliefs, people's emotions, um, their their inner thoughts. Um, so I think art is a really powerful expression and it's, it's a very novel way of mo mobilizing people, asking people to take action. Um, and, and that is what people have been doing because we've reached 98% of our 800 lions art pieces goal because we were hoping to get 800 pieces of line art and calf we were in the beginning we were saying are we we're ever going worried. to make this <laughs> yeah trying to fathom 800 lions was one thing but then trying to fathom 800 individual people to stand up for those 800 lions and it's it's nearly there our goal um we are nearly reaching it, so it's been it's been incredible. Um, and what what is going to happen to all of these artworks? What is what is the plan? How is change going to be made? Mm. Okay, so at the moment, all the art piece pieces are being uploaded onto our website, so people can go to the web address um, that I'm sure Janelle will put on um, the bottom in a minute, um, and it will be uploaded there. But ultimately, when we've reached our goal, we want to submit all those pieces of art to our Minister of Environment, uh, Minister Honorable Minister Barbara Creasy, and urge her to keep the lion bone quota at zero. At the moment, mm -hmm. a high level panel is deliberating what we should be doing with the commercial trade of amongst others lions, and we're saying, look, lots of people because it's not you know it's very powerful that people have taken the effort to to create their own expression um, in the form of art um, so we are going to submit that to the minister with a call to keep the um, the export quota at zero and hopefully obviously the ultimate goal for us is to end the the captive uh, commercial captive line breeding industry altogether but if we can keep that quota at zero that would be a very good start yeah and I think um, you know as as you were saying people have taken this this campaign on so incredibly. Um, the the different types of art that have been submitted to us from plays to poems to um, paintings with poems on them the most incredible sketches and drawings um, children's art I mean the, mm. the youth have truly truly stepped up I think almost fifty percent if not more of our our current submissions have been the youth um, so I'm really hoping that 
that the submission to Minister Creasy is really going to um, show her that that the people of South Africa and people around the world don't support the the export quota. Exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, is apparently a question in the comments, um, and I'm more than willing to answer that live. Um, what is your take on some of self-drive from SA stealing lion cubs in Botswana National Park to South Africa? That's quite interesting. Lou? It's a very interesting question now. We know that there is a lot, there have always been a lot of rumours, very little hard evidence, but there's always been rumours that um, lions and especially lion cubs are being taken from the wilds. Um, so not just uh, in from Botswana, but from South Africa's um, wilderness areas as well and Zimbabwe. And often this is to, to bring new um, fresh genetic material into the breeding because they've started breeding with a relatively small pool of lions. So you, you do get um, inbreeding issues. Um, so very often those wild lions are being taken to, to to bring fresh genes into the pool. Unfortunately, there's very little hard evidence um, that this is happening. And I know that um, Lord Ashcroft um, also had, uh, with his team when they did their investigation, very recently also got some evidence. But again, when they were trying to get the, the real hard evidence, um, I think the, the, the sort of the deal was off the table. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's a difficult one. Very often there's a lot of anecdotal information, there's a lot of information that we do get through people who work in the industry, um, but it's the hard evidence that is often lacking. Mm. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Brooks. I hope that um, answers your question. I think, um, thank you very much, Louise. I'm going to hop back to um, to Mary Ann. Let's see, I can see that she has, hi, Mary Ann. Hi, she Mary. has finished this artwork, which is absolutely unbelievable. I'm not sure if everybody um, at home has has got this far, but Mary Ann, that is absolutely beautiful. Oh, thank you. I'm, I did carry on scribbling while Louise was talking, but it's mm. fascinating to hear what you're saying, Louise. Um, so I'm going to move on now. I'm hoping that you can carry on scribbling at home. Um, just scribble, doodle, just make it really um, effortless. Do it while you're some doing something else. Um, and um and even when you're watching telly or a meeting or whatever just have a little doodle on the side of your page i'll put that one aside at the moment and then i wanted to go over um looking at the different ways that we might observe animals so um here i'm going to look at two different ways on this first one I shall look at uh, internal shapes and the second one I shall look at external shapes. So I'm looking right now at a, um, a lion who, um, this is one of the pride in Mfui in South Luangwa, which is the most phenomenal area of Zambia. And I'm uh, this, this particular lion, they're, they're very blonde, those lions. And just uh, have a think about when you're looking at a photograph of, or, a, or, or even a real animal, just look at the shape of the face. And you may well find you've got a strange hexagon going on. Can you see that hexagon there? Um, yeah. I'll draw it a little bit more, a bit heavier so you can see. And within that hexagon, there will be, there's a little bit of extra for the chin area. I'm looking at his face at the moment. I'm going to place the eyes just pretty much above. If this is where the jawbone is, then I'm looking just above, just above there for where I'm going to place the eyes. And it looks like nothing on earth at the moment, doesn't it? And this is generally where we all give up and think, oh, I can't, I can't draw. But, but let's carry on. 
let's carry on, see where it goes to. And I'm um, just carrying on drawing. I'm gonna, I've now located the ears, the eyes, and he looks like some absolutely weird creature, doesn't he? So, um, but hopefully, 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 it will soon turn into a lion. He's got a very domed nose, this one. In my photograph, he's absolutely covered in blood. Nasty. Sometimes that I don't- looks like a little bit of a, an off donkey. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it'll turn into a lion soon. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Um, so then we come back into the cat mouth here, locating the angle of those eyes, just slightly oblique. And the angle of the forehead is also slightly oblique here. And I'm afraid I am working all over the page all at once. So I'm now finding I need to move the nose a little bit across because of this angle here. And the nice thing is because I found, I've pretty much found the shapes and I'm still doing that scribble technique a little bit as we saw earlier. And he's got some little teeth, quite large ones in fact. And the big black inner lip curving round. Just again, once you've located an area, why not put the shadow on just to help and the chin coming underneath. The, when you're drawing lines, always remember that depth of the chin. It's incredibly, incredibly long. And then this area is where the mane is starting. So this is a, um, a young male, probably I'd say about five years old, four to five years old, quite a good mane starting. Marianne, do you ever use um, erasers? Uh, do very you ever do something and, and then erase it out because I'm very tempted to do that right now. Yeah, I, <laughs> I do. I, I come from a school of thought that says, well, there's, there's no rules really, is there? There shouldn't ever be any rules. However, when you're working, uh, when you're drawing animals from life, you've rarely got a single moment to mm. think. And um, so sometimes I'll find that I've put a, something in the wrong place. Um, I very, uh, very often in the bush, I'll work with a simple desk pencil like this, a rotating pencil, simply because I don't need to sharpen it. And uh, if you've ever worked outside, you realize that um, generally, uh, if you take a sharpener or a rubber, you will lose it because um, <laughs> uh, because generally, generally, uh, the one thing in the hand as well as the camera is is probably enough. Did you see how this uh, this um, he's he's just coming together now? I can see the different shapes. I can now put a tiny bit more tone in. Just remember that white under the eye is quite useful. Also, there's a little bit of white around the nostril. We can come around there and bring the, the, um, the fantastic dark lines, dark spots of where the whiskers come out. And that also allows me to curve around around the muzzle here. And gradually those supporting lines that that um, hexagon that I put in, first of all, will actually just start to disappear. And as soon as I put a little bit of his spiky mane in, this is one of the punks, by the way, anybody that knows South Rwanda in South in uh, Zambia, There's a, you know, one of the, the cheeky teenagers. Yeah, there's yeah, the, the cheeky teenagers. He's, he's the, <laughs> they're known as the three punks. Um, Lovely. And again, just scribbling away. And when I'm ready, I can be brave and go for my darkest darks, find those lines. And I think it probably help on the screen for you to be able to see those.
And a broken line is so useful. What do you mean by broken line, Marianne? So when when you're drawing even a, a complete shape, like here, I've drawn up the eye, I've stopped, and then it becomes very soft, a lot softer there. Um, and so I've then broken the line, I've lifted the pressure off the pencil to come back and out, and then I've put the pressure down again. And that creates a, a, a much more dynamic and more interesting view, really, um, and a more interesting drawing. Darken up some of his nose. He's got a lot of blood on his nose. Most of these lions um, in South Rwanda are quite blonde. Um, they, they, we had a, a very famous lion called Ginger um, who um, was completely ginger and he has a very pale nose. This, this particular one has got a dark nose in my photograph. Hope you're all drawing. <laughs> oh, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying very hard. <laughs> you see where I've, I've already put quite a lot of pressure on the pencil in in these areas just to really be sure where where my marks are um and and to obliterate some of my original marks and it's meant that the meant that the do you remember i was talking about the dark of the lips well we can't mm. see the dark of the lips anymore he's just got his tongue here and so i'm going to really go in i'm going to put a lot of pressure on that pencil and don't be afraid to go darker and darker and darker. Especially something like buffalo, actually. And I'm not delineating. I'm describing, but I'm not putting a whole line around something. And again, same as that line in the previous drawing, to make that chin really stand forward as much brighter, and to come in with a much darker mane underneath all that shadow area underneath the chin. That's why mine looks so strange. He doesn't have a chin. Ah, uh -huh, you see, I told you, you've got to be looking for a chin. <laughs> okay. And then I can really start to play, like I did said said with the previous one, play with the tip of the pencil. Allow the tip, the the spiky lines of that very sharp point to give a wonderful dynamic. And you can still scribble over the whole thing. You can describe it even more. And in a way, if you're excited when you're seeing an animal like this, the more dynamic the, na the, the line, the better. Um, because you want a little bit of excitement to actually come out in the drawing itself. Definitely comes alive, that's for sure. And see, I need to sharpen my pencil. <laughs> well, while, while you're doing that, um, thank you very much, um, Marianne. We are going to, uh, let's talk about the, the overall campaign that um, 800 Lions belongs to, um, our partner, uh, World Animal Protection, and their uh, hashtag in wildlife trade campaign. And just to orient everybody around this campaign, we're going to show a little introductory video.
All right, so to um, chat about World Animal Protection and their hashtag in wildlife trade campaign, I'm going to be chatting to Edith, um, who is the um, campaign manager for wildlife, the wildlife campaign, um, World Animal Protection Africa. Am I right, Edith? Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How are you, Charles, and everybody else on this in this station? Of course, it's yeah. exciting having all of you this evening, this afternoon. I don't know wherever you are. We are yes. really excited to have you in this joint session. Thanks for standing for the lions. Thanks for standing for wildlife. Definitely. So, Edith, yeah. let's let's get started. In that video, um, the video mentioned the G20. Can you get uh, just started with a brief? an um, explanation about what the G20 is and what role they play. Yeah, so straight into the question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Don't mess around here. <laughs> yeah, of course, the G20 are the, the big economic guys, uh, of course, of this, of this world. Mm -hmm. When we talk of the G20, we are talking of countries uh, like Argentina, uh, Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, the, and of course, a number of countries in the European Union, uh, mm -hmm. of course, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Italy, and then, of course, when we cross into Asia, as I mentioned, we have Indonesia, then we have Japan, and then there are several other countries uh, like Mexico, Russia, Saudi Arabia, uh, South Africa, of course, on the African continent, and mm -hmm. then South Korea, Turkey, the United Kingdom, and the USA. And then, of course, we have other countries like um, Spain, which is a permanent guest on the G20. So okay. basically, the G20 is a group of 20 countries. Uh, it brings these leaders together uh, from both the developed and developing countries, as I mentioned them. And mm -hmm. these uh, really basically come from all the five continents, as I mentioned. And throughout the year, representatives from these countries really get together to discuss uh, financial and socioeconomic issues that uh, mm -hmm. affect the world. So when we are talking about um, wildlife trade and uh, this campaign, mm -hmm. uh, these members, uh, being kind of the drivers of the global economy, they, they have a, a key leadership role in managing the global financial and social impacts of okay. uh, different issues, including the COVID-19, which is affecting, has affected the global economy, it has uh, affected the health sector, it has affected us uh, from a social perspective. So we expect that they are expected to take a leadership role in really mm. discussing these issues when they meet at the next uh, uh, summit, which is due in November 22nd, 20, I mean 21st, 22nd this year. So basically, in okay. summary, that's the G20. All right. So I was, that's what I was going to ask is, are they, are they definitely still um, meeting this year? Because I think uh, it's, it's almost more important now than ever before for them to actually meet and discuss all of these issues that we've been experiencing. Um, yeah. So then, yes, yeah, sorry, Edith. Yeah, please go ahead and uh, finalize the question. You're still going on. Sorry for interrupting you. No, not at all. Um, so my next question will, will kind of go into where World Animal Protection is now um, approaching the G20 with this campaign idea. Um, I know that the world that World Animal Protection um, started this campaign at the beginning of this year, am I correct? The, the hashtag in wildlife trade campaign aimed at the G20. Yes, you are very right. As okay. we all know, as we all know, the, the, the COVID pandemic, uh, of course, the lockdown started around March, although the outbreak dates back as uh, November, December last year in China. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it reached most of the continents around the end at the beginning of the year. So yeah. from the beginning of the year, as World Animal Protection, we decided that we were going to wrap up all our campaigns around COVID-19, specifically mm -hmm. our campaigns around 
uh, the wildlife the, the wildlife sector. Mm -hmm. So our end wildlife trade campaign uh, has one goal, and this is about calling upon the G20 uh, to come up with the policies policy changes to end wildlife trade at the international level, but also at the national levels. And why are we uh, specifically concerned with wildlife trade? It's because we know wildlife trade inherently uh, is cruel as wild, mm -hmm. wild animals are taken out of the wild, out of their habitats, to be used in commercial entertainment, to be used as pets, to be used in traditional medicine, to be used in fashion. Mm -hmm. And all this, of course, millions and millions of animals are suffering in this kind of trade. But leave alone the suffering that animals go through it in itself is putting us at risk if we are talking about pandemics like COVID-19. So that is the whole reason why we are engaging with, with the G20, because we can no longer ignore the devastating effect that um, the global commercial wildlife trade is having on our health, on our planet, but also yeah. on our economy, because in fact, recently, the UN Secretary General did mention that um, this pandemic has pushed the world backwards, like 10 years backwards. And this mm -hmm. is very, very, it's a very, very significant drawback. And we cannot simply stand and look on. That is why we are calling upon the G20 to take action. And I mean, time is running out, not only for the animals, but also for us. Uh, as we face uh, this kind of global pandemic, we mm -hmm. face such exclusion because we are all holed up in our homes. Uh, we are facing, I think, the biggest ecological crisis of our time, just mm -hmm. because we decided to break our relationship with animals. So that is why we launched this campaign and we continue to pursue it. Okay, and then how, how can people um, support this campaign? Just uh, there is the link at the bottom, but if you can just explain a little bit about the petition, please. Yeah, so yeah, so the G20 countries will be meeting, as I mentioned, uh, at their summit on the 21st and 22nd of November this year in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And we understand that uh, COVID-19 will be one of those issues they will be discussing from an economic perspective and really how to build back will be part on that of that agenda, we understand. So we are mobilizing uh, the public mm -hmm. uh, to sign our petition. Actually, our aim is to collect 1 million signatures. In fact, we are almost, uh, we are almost there because the last time I checked, mm -hmm. we were just over 900,000 K. In fact, we are, we are left with around 67 uh, signatures clock That's one million so that will mean 100 i mean 1 million people have cared to really petition the the the, the g20 and what we are calling upon our That's leaders amazing. is that we have cared they need to care too yes to and there's the no community. way they can ignore that yeah yeah 100 no that's incredible and just um to kind of bring the, the 800 Lions campaign, um, our joint campaign, and the, the End Wildlife Trade campaign together. How does the captive lion breeding industry fit into this campaign? And how can people who have supported the 800 Lions campaign also, um, just so they know why, they can also sign the petition? Yeah, cool. That is really a very good question. Uh, first of all, I want to highlight the fact that South Africa is a member of the G20 and the only one, of course, from the African continent. But also it is one of the, it is the world's largest exporter of live animals and other parts from the, the captive, captive industry, including the lions. So meaning that South Africa is part and parcel of this global uh, wildlife trade that is making millions and millions of animals suffer, but also putting our lives in the danger of uh, pandemics. Mm -hmm. So basically we want South Africa to support a global ban on wildlife mm -hmm. trade, but of course charity begins at home. First of all, we are asking the South African government to uh, scrap the lion-born uh, export quota. 
I actually keep it at zero, but even ultimately close down the lion trade, the lion bone industry and all the other captive breeding industry that puts the lives of animals uh, at risk. Mm. So how do these campaigns really relate? Uh, of course, we are also asking countries to implement domestic policies. So meaning that if South Africa implements a domestic policy to end their trade, being the biggest, uh, the biggest traders actually, then that will significantly contributing to the, our overall global call to end wildlife trade. So we implore you, all of you who are participating in this uh, art session, please mm -hmm. go on our website and actually even uh, on your screens, you'll see our link uh, scrolling. Just copy that link, uh, click it, get in and sign the petition. You will be contributing to this petition. We need the next 65,000, I mean 67 signatures to reach the, the, the 1 million signatures. And in that way, you will have stood with us, you will have stood with the lions, you will have stood with the wildlife globally to end. Definitely. The Thank you, Edith. So for, for everybody um, listening, the link to the petition has been put in the comments. So please go and add your add your name, add your voice there um, and support this, this World Animal Protection campaign. Thank you very much, Edith. Um, we are going to get back to Mary Ann and see how this lion is coming along. Oh, wow. I'm, I've... I've been, I've been fiddling. <laughs> so um, who knows? Who knows? It's not quite. It, it's it's tricky because I'm working um, with various different media. So the watercolor. If I put more color on, of course, with the water soluble, it mixes. However, it's quite fun. It's quite fun to just work in, and just carry on fiddling with your drawing. Don't worry about um, where it's got to because there's always another stage. And the joy of it is you can start again as well. Um, just give him a little bit of the eyes there. And then I think I'll turn the page and start something new. Um, so that one, do you remember I was I was looking at basic hexagon shape? Yes. Someone actually oh. said in the comments, Marianne, I can't believe that this started as a hexagon. It's oh, really? <laughs> that it went from a hexagon to this, this lion that has just jumped off the page at you. It's amazing. And, and I think, you know, if I was critical, I would say, well, maybe the eyes are a little bit too close together, but you know, it's a, it's a sketch. It's a, it's a, it's a drawing that we're not going to worry about. And I think the key thing is, is to keep the energy that you feel in the wild or about a certain animal. If you care about an animal, if you feel passionate about it, if you're, if you're scared about it, um, then try and keep that in your mark making. And sometimes um, to work quickly, like I've got 10 minutes for each of these drawings, um, sometimes that actually helps with parceling up all of that energy into um, a short amount of time, putting it on the page quickly, and then maybe remembering that he might have some red on his chinny chin tin as well. Um, so, so, um, so just try to maybe try to do um, shorter drawings rather than longer, um, yeah. especially when you're in that that exploring um, exploring part of a drawing where you're getting to know an animal, and you might well have many different photographs around you that you want to work from um, before uh, really focusing in on an uh, on one particular pose. So I'm going to put that one aside, um, let that dry a little bit, and then I'm going to come to external shapes. And um, anyone that's been with me on, on, on their very first safari or um, it will, will hear me talk about ice cream cones. And um, I don't know what ice cream cones look like for you, but very often uh, we've just got an ice cream cone and it's fallen fallen on its side like this could could be a great big microphone couldn't it but um can you see that any maybe it's not clear enough i'll, I'll just a little bit um faint but we i think we've got the general general idea general idea cone analogy helps yeah <laughs> we've got a cone going on 
Um, and um, this, the line I'm drawing from here is looking a little bit upright. But anyway, there's a cone here. And again, you might find somewhere in that cone, you might find your hexagon again. This one is looking to the side. So it's a very lopsided hexagon. <laughs> so it's probably that all of you who know your, your geometry will tell me it's not a hexagon, but anyway. And I'm gonna put the chin on the hexagon, the ears on the hexagon. I'm gonna locate where the eyes are. And soon enough, yeah, I'm going to locate the nose as well, somewhere in that area. I'm hoping it's it's um, dark enough for you there. Yeah, we can see. Move the eye across a little bit. And so the main then is the ice cream, if you like. Oh, man has a, a massive mane and a tiny face. <laughs> That's okay. He's a very <laughs> fine lion. A fine, <laughs> fine lion. And, you know, you may well find that you work in different ways and you prefer to, to uh, look for different shapes. Um, however, this, this one seems to work for me. Because, look, when you start um, putting a paw here, or a pour out the side here. Let's curve this one round. Going a little bit off piste now from my photograph. Um, and then coming to the haunches, we've got the lion's back. You've all gone quiet. <laughs> I'm, co I'm concentrating. <laughs> and you might have a tail swooping around here. And, that. and there may be another, another paw coming out. I think this one, he's going to stretch his leg a little bit here. So I've got space for another paw at the back here. And do you see how that basic triangle and a circle or a cone and a circle has actually just decided to, to turn itself into a lion? So if I straighten those lines up um, so you can see them more clearly. Those lovely triangular eyes. This one's a very peaceful looking lion, isn't he? A little bit dopey. <laughs> the fantastic thing about drawing lions in the bush is that they sleep so much. And so you'll always find a lion somewhere at rest. And that is just such a, a privilege to be able to do, to sketch them in the wild when they're resting. And now I can just continue on doing all those lovely details that we, we saw on the previous drawings. Looking for my shade areas, I've got to locate where my darkest darks are, I've got to allow that chin to stand forward, the white of the chin, that depth of the chin. And those marvellous nostrils. And you can really enjoy looking at them. The other in really indicative part is those little eyebrows that they've got. And it just mm. points us back up, doesn't it? it? Gives them so much expression. It does. And then continuing to draw and allow my pencil again to be nice and flowing. And 
yeah, as I say, gone, I've gone completely off piste from my photograph because I really want a, a pore to curve around this area here. And all of that started from a very, very basic shape. Yeah. And um, yeah. so again, you know, don't be afraid to have those. Well, it's almost like a cartoon really underneath, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You've got, um, you know, things, no harm at all in copying the, the most fantastic cartoons you'll find, of course, are things like The Lion King, those mm -hmm. sorts of drawings, really simplistic, simplistic drawings. Um, but actually they tell you so much about where the, the form of the animal is. And all of us will go through phases where the, the, the animal we're drawing just doesn't look particularly real. Mm. And then suddenly it changes and it's, it's, um, its whole nature will change. Yeah, I think this technique definitely helps with the, the the facial structure for me. I think my previous one, the facial structure was a bit wonky, um, but this one's definitely looking more lion than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so no, when, when there are always moments when a lion will look a little bit like a polar bear, or mm. um, and uh, just go with it. I think go go. Go with the polar bear for a look for a little while, or or any kind of bear. They they can they can look quite extraordinary, um, but um, because once you put the colour on, um, it 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 will change it entirely. So here I might well I don't know where that leg is going to sit. that that leg is folding in a little bit of an uncomfortable way behind him. He's it's going to articulate around this way. Um, I might even have to move the the back there a little bit um but once you put the color on of course it changes it changes altogether um so where you had a polar bear you might suddenly find oh look i've got a, i've got a a real lion going on here and generally um however pale your lions um they will have a little bit of a a yellow tint to them won't they um and here I'm going to just accentuate my yellow for this for the screens because otherwise um, you won't see where I'm painting. Um, so he'll be a bit brighter than most lines that you'd see in the wild. So Marianne, let's let's chat a little bit about just while you're um, adding some color to him. What sure. is what is Art Safari um, and what what do you offer? Uh, Art Safari. Yeah. Art Safari started actually in in Malawi. Um, I I was out there for a number of uh, months. I'm I'm English. Um, in case you hadn't guessed, but um, I was I was out in Malawi um, on a on an expedition, um, and I um, thought, hang on, how can I spend more time in the bush? How can I? Um, in, I, I loved wildlife, I loved being in the bush um, and so I really wanted to share the way I was seeing the bush with other people and obviously as, a, as an artist I can't think of any other way, any better way than seeing the bush than having your feet on the ground and actually sketching while you're, while you're um, on safari because you actually see things so clearly so you have to stop, you have to observe you have to really take time to to really look, and I found that um, by by sketching and by leading others and showing others how you can sketch in on safari, and that it's possible to do so by using basic shapes, by just scribbling, by persevering, by practicing, mm -hmm. by having endless mistakes, and then carrying on. Um, all of that made makes for such an exciting um, time, and it's a it's it's a an air, it's a 
time when you really feel as if you're very very engaged in in the world around you in the world mm -hmm. and in the wildlife around you so i started up art safari um, i came back to england and started up art safari as a tour operator um, a safari company um, mm -hmm. and we work now not only in malawi but um south africa botswana namibia um, we have a lodge in Zambia and we work all and in fact we even do um, trips, um, cultural trips in, in Italy and other, other places as well um, because so many people seize that idea of let's go and, let's go and paint and sketch because mm -hmm. um, it is, it's, it's a very addictive thing to do I think you'll find as well. It is, it's a very different concept for, for a tour operator so what in your opinion, what makes Art Safari just that much um, of a different uh, tour experience to to the things that other tour operators can offer? In many ways, it's because we work, uh, we, we like to spend a lot of time in one place um, uh, because you can't just take a photograph and move on. You can, in fact, do um, you, you, you can do a sketch very quickly. But um, in order to really feel part of, a, part of an environment, you might really want to spend um, many days in one lodge rather than moving to different lodges. Um, and so we do tend to um, slow down the itineraries and we have some residential trips. So that, for, for example, at um, Thornycroft in, in South Rwangwa, we spend a whole week in one lodge. Um, mm -hmm. And and the 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 fantastic thing is is you you get to know everybody you get to know you 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 get to know so much more about the place you're in you you learn so much about the animals um, not only about um, the 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 habitat um, and the types of animals that are in the park. But you learn that this pride was related to that pride. You get to know the, the different um, the different leopards that are about. Um, there's there's so much to so much depth that you learn, and also you start noticing the the other animals that are about. <laughs> You're not just mm -hmm. focused on on um, one specific creature that you wanted to go and see. You end up um, really knowing um, a lot about the whole environment. Mm. And where, um, just out of interest, what is your what is your favourite African destination that you've been to, that you've sketched at, that you've visited? You know, so many people ask me this. <laughs> many times I will say, uh, and I answer differently every time, of course, mm -hmm. um, because most of the time it's the place I've most recently been in. Um, mm -hmm. And so my last trip should have been Zambia, should have been before that Namibia. <laughs> Um, but in fact, um, this year being so different, my last yeah. year, my last trip was South Africa um, in the and and the Thule block in Botswana, um, and I would say that that was the most phenomenal wildlife experience. It was wonderful fun, um, but I suppose uh, it was the first time I'd been there, so it's the first time I was actually getting to know people there um, because the people element is so important as well. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I, I really, I think that South Rwangwa in Zambia and Malawi are, because they were my first areas that I went to, um, they will always remain my favourites. It holds a special place in your heart, I think. They do, they do. But of course, if I've just come back from Vietnam or, or Cambodia, I might say there. <laughs> exactly. It's when it was most, most fresh in your mind. Yeah. Um, and then can I just ask very quickly, uh, the, the scroller at the bottom says that um, your art safaris are currently virtual. How do you have a virtual painting safari? Oh, what's funny was we're, we're actually doing a virtual safari in Zambia at the moment. I'm, I'm focusing on um, elephants and carmine bee eaters for this one. Mm -hmm. And um, and it works extremely well. So we're on, on, on a platform just like this one on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're working um, to, I, I, I run little demos like, like these that are a little bit more extended than these. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then uh, show artwork from other artists as well, who've worked in those, in those particular areas. Um, 
And then we have time uh, after the class with lots of exercises to go away and work um, work up some of some drawings afterwards, uh, drawings and paintings afterwards. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, it, it's surprisingly real. Um, and um, it, it feels very, very much as if you're on safari, not as if you're on safari because you're going to your own bed every night, but um, but uh, you you're definitely part of a group of people who are in, enjoying being together and painting together. Yes. And was it a new concept that you you had to start because of um, the pandemic and because of the global lockdown? Yes, that's absolutely right. It is. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how we um, we have adapted um, to this new way of life and almost everything can be virtual these days. It's amazing. I know, I know. I mean, nothing will um, replace the sounds of the bush um, mm -hmm. and the smells of the bush. So actually, if I'm working on my own, I might well have one of the webcams up from one of the one of the lodges. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a, a fantastic um, organization called explore.org I should um, when you're drawing your lions actually go go to that put on one of the webcams you'll feel as if you're in the bush and you'll get some of the tension and it changes the, your mark making mm -hmm. in uh, when you showed that video earlier and there was um, a, a, a fantastic music in the background of the video my mark making became much more exciting Mm. So, um, so if you have music on, or if you have the just the sounds of the bush in the background, you will find that your drawings will change um, and become yeah more more dynamic and more exciting. Mm. That's it's so inspiring. Um, I think I've said that word a couple of times this evening, but I'm not an artist, um, a, a drawing artist by any means. But this entire campaign, everything, all the submissions that have come through, everything that we've learned so far and um, this evening with you has just it's been absolutely incredible um so i think it, this this guy looks almost done if yeah. um, if not he's already jumping off the page um so i think we can we can finish off with our our final um mm -hmm. tutorial which i'm very excited about okay lovely so i shall move him off the board and um, and yes, I mean you can carry on fiddling with these things forever. And sometimes, sometimes you shouldn't fiddle, really. <laughs> yeah. So for this one, I'm going to go to uh, one of my sketchbooks, um, and um, because what I wanted to talk about is, uh, and you know, often you take a photograph after you've finished sketching. Um, mm. But what I wanted to talk about on this one was how uh, when when you're looking at an animal you might be wanting to find something that seizes your eye so um, is uh, the animal is moving um, and you may find that you've drawn the the the, uh, the lion when sorry it's not an elephant <laughs> <laughs> you've drawn the lion when he's sleeping um, you've drawn him when he's uh, just sitting up and staring at you um, you've drawn him in various different positions, but it's actually when he's doing something really exciting um, that you, you, that's the moment you want to seize. And so here I'm, I'm going to just see whether you can see this line. I'll try to draw it fairly dark so you can see the line. And this this line of the backbone that's so indicative of what the animal is doing. And um, so here I'm drawing, this is a lioness who's just having a lovely, lovely stretch. She's just got up. And how would you capture something like this on a safari, um, Marianne, if you don't mind me asking? Actually, it's... just in a, in a sketchbook. Um, so oh, yeah. I, I carry sketchbooks like this um, around with me. Um, Let's see whether we can find other scenes that might. So, and I can just draw uh, endless pages of of lions. Uh, I've got various elephants and things going on here, or landscapes going on. And, and there you've got a leopard. Um, mm -hmm. So I would draw. I would have 
I would have a sketchbook on my lap. Um, and 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 really, I, this is exactly how I would be working. I would be thinking, oh, where's 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 the shoulders? Mm -hmm. Let's find the shoulders. Let's find the stretch. He's doing that. She's doing a wonderful, wonderful stretch here. And so the, 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 the sketchbook becomes, it can be full of all sorts of body parts. Um, and you're not to worry about that because that's part of the learning process as well. Mm. And by having, by having put that backbone first, I can then work out what's happening in the rest of the animal. It becomes easier to hang the the rest of the skeleton on top. And when I'm talking about skeletons, it's actually very useful to know a little bit of the anatomy. I'm going to pull this belly even further back, move this foot even further back, get rid of that bit there. Don't need that. And there's this wonderful stretch going on. Mm. And that lovely thick, thick tail. And so if I go into here, and all of that started by the backbone. And yes, I can see the second shoulder out the back here. But really what I'm looking at is the shoulder blade here, the the forearm, the bone. I'm looking at where the articulation is, here to the elbow, here to the paws. Let's send that one back by shading it in. The backbone is, of course, curling around here with the pelvis in this area and the articulation comes to the knee joint here, to the ankle joint and mm. down to the foot here. Um, and again, look how that nice curve is coming around. And uh, when you're looking at a, a, a lion skeleton, um, a lion skull face on, you would see that fabulous um, shape that we were looking at before, which face on actually looks much more um, more diamond shape. Uh, where's my sketch gone? And a really nice, really nice stretch going on here. and much more length to the back of the head than I've actually given it, really. Mm. But I'll bring the ear a little bit through here. And so you can see how the, a little bit of knowledge of, of the, the skeleton really helps, really helps. There's plenty of images to look at on the internet. Um, can't see where this back foot is going to go. It's May, maybe she's got one a little bit further back. It's quite interesting um, that that you're chatting about the the skeleton and the way you know it all it all works together. Um, and I just I have to make the link with the whole reason why we're here um, this evening um, and why this campaign was started is because of these these lion skeletons and the bones and the body parts. Um, of big cats that are being used in in traditional medicines, um, and just to remind everybody um, who is watching that eight hundred voices for eight hundred lines. Um, the campaign came about because um, eight hundred lion skeletons is the legal export quota out of South Africa. Um, for, for the, the lion bone trade. Um, so just to, to bring everybody back to 
kind of our our topic and our our whole reason for being here. Mm. And here I'm just bringing in a little bit of tone, just because it's water soluble, it's moving very easily on the page. Mm. And it also means that that underdrawing where the skeleton was can vaguely disappear. And I can just move that pigment on the page. And she's really having a good stretch, isn't she? Mm. You don't have a lot of, um, I know you said the paint is water, water soluble, but you don't have a lot of paint on the, on the brush, am I right? There's no paint at all on this brush. Okay, so it's just water. It's just water. That's amazing. Um, and then I could, you know, you can then carry on drawing. You can carry on. Once this is dry, you can, I could carry on painting on this. But certainly you might be tempted to say, okay, let's, let's make this, let's work out a little bit more about the muscles, uh, the shapes around. Um, you could, again, you can draw more in. You can decide to have more shadow in some areas. Often you can see the, the backbone just here, can't you? A little bit. But draw how the movement comes to life. Sorry to interrupt. It's fun and it's exciting. Mm -hmm. it's, that's the that's the great thing. Mm -hmm. Um and and to, to push through all those mistakes that we all make all the time. <laughs> 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 and to you know, step away from the eraser. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and and to yeah, just to enjoy it. And what fabulous subjects to draw. I mean, so amazing, so amazing to draw them. Always, um, it's it's quite refreshing, really, when you start putting the ground in. Um, and then you could think, oh, hang on, I've got, I've, I've got a bit of extra time. Where, where, what else am I going to put in here? Should I have another lion in? Should there be something else going on? Um, and and m maybe, maybe there's um, opportunity to put something else in there. You could have a tree coming here. You could have uh, maybe there's uh, one of the cubs just looking at its mother. Um, they really do look like polar bears when you start to draw them um, with big paws. Yes. Well, this one looks like a mouse, actually. But, <laughs> but with that um, very typical wide stance of the back legs. And a bigger, bigger eyes, of course. So you could, you, and I'm not going to move his ears around. So the, that could be, there could be other lions lying around. I mean, very often when you've got a pride, um, you're able to see uh, somebody with a big tummy here mm. coming off page. And equally in the distance, you might have... Um, I don't know. Maybe there's a zebra walking past. Didn't know. Didn't know what was going on. I think that happens more often than the zebras are willing to admit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when they stumble upon a pride. Exactly. That is just. It's been. I haven't been drawing during this one. I've I've taken this opportunity to just watch, and it's been absolutely mesmerizing. Um, I think everyone, everyone who is tuned in and who is watching, um, we would we would really love to see your artworks. I don't think it's possible for you to um, pop them in the comments here, but if you do uh, post them online um, on social media, please use the hashtag 800 lions um, and we will definitely see them. Um, Marianne, that, that includes you too. So please <laughs> post them and, um, and show everybody how absolutely talented you are. I've been completely blown away this evening. Thank you so much um, for showing us 
these incredible techniques um, and for joining us. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for, for allowing me to be to be part of it. Yeah, it's been fabulous. Thank you. Of um, course. Keep drawing, everybody. Just keep scribbling. Yes, please. Um, add on to your drawings, post them, let us know um, how, they, how they've gone, how they've come out. We would really love to see them. Um, so just one last um, thing, Julika, I see you have asked what's the ultimate deadline. Um, I think Sunday midnight, if not Monday, first thing, um, we was just so that everybody can kind of have the, the weekend to finish off their sketches if they would like to. I think Monday first thing we will we will close the 800 lines submission. Just a, um, a reminder that we can only sub, uh, accept one submission per person and just so that we do we genuinely have 800 individual um, voices, individual people for the 800 lines. Um, between us, we we wouldn't be sad if um, if you submitted your drawing under your partners, nieces, nephews, sons, daughters, aunties, uncles' names. Um, get them involved. Um, get them to do the submissions. Um, we are nearly there. Um, so just a reminder to please submit your artworks. Um, we have until Monday, and please sign the World Animal Protection. Um, petition, the hashtag in wildlife trade petition. The link to that is in the comments if anyone um, would like it. I think Beth or, or Janelle, if you can please post that link for people to sign the petition once more. Um, Maria, it is being recorded as far as we know. Um, we're going to do our best to put this up on YouTube tomorrow. Um, it is a, a bit of a new platform for us, so hopefully we've got it right. Um, but hopefully this will be up on YouTube. We'd love for everybody to be able to come back to it um, and have a look at the way that Marianne was, was sketching from the beginning. Um, so to close, thank you very much to everybody um, who joined us this evening. We are so grateful. And thank you if you have already submitted to our 800 Lion campaign. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, for adding your voice um, and standing up for our lions. Um, if you haven't yet, please do, and please um, motivate and encourage your friends and family to do so too. Um, we're going to close off this live stream with a video of just a couple of the, the submissions, the art and poetry submissions that we've had so far. So thank you very much, everybody, and have a good evening or afternoon. I'm not sure where everyone's based. Thanks. <laughs>